Hi. Hey guys. Evening, sir. Four with us right now. Can you guys hear me? I'm signed in as Rishi today. because I needed to be the host. 46, 47. How are you today, sir? Can someone speak? Because I don't seem to be hearing anything. It looks like you guys can hear me. Can you hear us? Yeah. Hello. Can you hear us? So I no. think you're having some audio problems. Yeah, probably. He can't hear you. If he can't hear us, how are we supposed to tell him that? Just text him <laughs> it. Let's just... Yeah, we're all pretty good at this. <sighs> Well, how are we supposed to ask questions and stuff? Just text Chat. in. Tell him we can't hear you. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. Yep. Good. Good. How do you I hear us? To, oh, I have to switch. Can to you hear us? Headset. Yes, I can hear you guys. Okay, we'll start with, uh, do you have any questions? Actually, we won't start. Sorry. I got to go grab my cup of tea. Sorry. 30 seconds.
Okay, I'm back. Let's start with questions. Unmute yourself, ask a question and mute yourself back, please. We have 56. No questions? Can you guys hear me? I couldn't make it to last class, so could you do a quick recap on what you learned, we learned? Uh, were you able to peruse through the presentation on Slack? Yeah, yeah I looked through the presentation, but um, very good. I want to like, know how you... Yeah, very good. Um, I'm happy to do a quick recap. I always do a recap at the beginning of every previous class, so I will do that. Any other questions? No questions? Yes, Aksha, thank you. I, I post a poll pretty much every week and it doesn't look like people are interested in participating in the poll, so. I would request you guys to participate in the poll. Uh, this week's poll was about um, was about if people would like a second class, say on a Friday at 5 p.m., where we could do a quick catch up on uh, on you know questions, etc., or we could even do a, a rehash of the class on a different set of terms. If I cover a particular class in an advanced set of topics, then I'll try to uh, make it less advanced of the following one and vice versa. If, if one class I think uh, stays at a very low level, uh, if Pradyum doesn't ask his question, that is maybe we'll stay at a low level, um, or Tarun, uh, then uh, I mean it in a good way, guys. Thank you. Your questions are, uh, shows that you guys are super interested as well as operating at a very good level. That's why I, I, I picked on you guys. Um, so if it is the reverse, then we can cover our more advanced topics on Friday. So I'll leave it to you guys, but please participate in the poll. Please always go in. Every week there will be a poll. Um, you know, just shows that you guys are engaged. Okay. Uh, no other questions, quickly reaching the 60 mark. Uh, I seem to have some questions on Slack, but I won't answer it now. I will just look at the chat if there are any questions. What does poll mean again, Ethan? Uh, if you are on Slack and you go to the entrepreneurship channel, uh, and either on the right side, there are pinned items. And if you, if you don't have a right column, then below the name of the channel at the top, shelter encoding, there is a pin. You click on that and you get the pinned items. I will pin all of my important posts. Specifically, I will pin the files uh, as in the presentations, etc. I will also pin the polls I post. But if you scroll through, scroll through the entrepreneurship channel as well, there will be, you will see the polls. All you have to do is press yes or no. That's it. It's as easy as that. Yes or no. Boom. You're done. Someone asked me on Slack, is it hard to join a team right now? No, it's not. Um, I also posted uh, an FAQ. Uh, it's also pinned. Uh, it is also pinned on... Uh, on Slack in the entrepreneurship channel. And if you don't have a team, uh, there are instructions in the FAQ on how to either form a team or join a team. So it's not too late to either form a team or to join a team, not too late at all. I have 14 teams. And if you look at an average of four people or five people per team, uh, that's a good 70 people who are in teams. But that also says that, uh, that there are 138 folks on Slack. That means half of them don't have a team yet. So 
please do form to use. Any other questions? I'm going through the uh, list of uh, participants. Okay, we'll get started. So today's class is about financials. Financials meaning the, hold on. Financial meaning how do you measure uh, value of your startup? How do you measure various different KPIs of the startup? KPIs being key for performance indicators. But before we jump into financials, um, here's a master agenda. We are spot on at the halfway mark. Uh, we've learned quite a bit. As I said, the first three classes were more, uh, you know, uh, more generic, but then since last week, we started uh, to hit the rubber meets the road uh, part of this class. Uh, this week, we'll go deeper into uh, components of a startup and financials being such an important part of it. Uh, again, most people get technology right, but they don't get the rest of the stuff right. So this is an important class from that perspective. Uh, but again, the, a recap for the first four, four weeks. Uh, uh, week one, we learned, and this is for those who are also looking uh, and asking me questions if they can join a team. So, you know, what I ask people to do is look at your area of passion. What are you passionate about? And, and you know, the teams that are formed here uh, in this class have shown there are some people interested in art, some in uh, saving the earth, some in financial, financial frameworks, financial ideas, uh, sports obviously is always up there, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm happy that many of you have had, have passion in trying to either save the earth or do some social good. I'm really happy that a, a lot of you have formed teams uh, and have ideas in that area of passion. That's an area of passion for me too. Uh, and then we learned about how to look at problems in your area of passion. And, and, and if you find a problem that is worth solving, worth solving meaning that there is a solid business plan around it as we learned in week three, then lo and behold, you have a startup idea. Uh, week two went deep into one of my favorite entrepreneurs. Uh, we, 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 we looked at, I'm sorry, that was week three where we went, went and, and, um, and looked at Mark Zuckerberg's IPO letter we dissected it. We learned quite a bit from it. We learned some important lessons. More importantly, we learned the hacker way. We learned who a venture capitalist is and why they are the best friend of uh, an entrepreneur. We also learned components of the business plan, how you have to complete the puzzle. Um, and, and that business plan, we, we, we kind of uh, delved into it in week three. And now we're going deeper into into portions of it. Week two uh, was a fun class. Uh, we, we talked about leadership traits and, and, uh, and integrity and the value of hard work. And then last week, we, we, we went into uh, talking about how do you start a company? How can you incorporate uh, in Delaware as a state? Do you need to incorporate or not? Uh, what is paper money? What is valuation? Uh, we, we, we went through some important Silicon Valley terms, as I call the lingo of uh, Sand Hill Road. And we learned about pivot and pre money, post money, paper money, et cetera. We also learned last week about when is a startup deemed to be successful? Because till there is this exit as an event, it's all paper money. And so how do you, how do you go in into uh, into learning uh, how to get a startup to success, either taking it into an initial public offering, which is listing it in, in, in Wall Street, or getting an exit as in a merger or an acquisition. Um, so that was the first four weeks. Um, then this slide I would put up at the onset of every uh, uh, session as well. Uh, the business plan components, importantly, are problem statement. Again, what's your passion? 
and what's the area of problem in it and and have you found a big big enough problem and then the second part being what's your solution to that problem do you have the ability to solve that problem or is it not solvable for example you know uh, getting to mars is a big problem but it's not solvable at the moment unless uh, your name ends with musk um, and then we start diving in into what is the business model of how you will achieve revenues, how, we, how you will achieve uh, you know, uh, output from selling your products. What's the product and technology? Very importantly, we discussed the, uh, the aspect of competition. Who are your competitors? How will you sell the product and how will you market it? The team, and as I mentioned to you that uh, VCs invest in teams, teams, teams. Uh, and then lastly, the financial model uh, portion of your business plan. And today we'll dive in into the financial model, right? So again, uh, very quickly, what happens to successful startups? They exit. What is an exit? They, they either have an IPO, which is a listing in the Wall Street, uh, in, in the stock exchange, or they get acquired or merged. And so today's session is all about measuring that success, right? So how do you measure the value of a startup? How do you measure uh, uh, what, what you are achieving with the startup in terms of sales, right? So really, um, if you can measure it, then obviously you can, uh, you can measure success. And me if you're successful, then you can have an exit. Um, I really want to ingrain two major points into each of you. And if there is one slide you pay attention to, uh, this, um, so someone asked a question, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question as well. Someone asked a question in the chat, what is an acquisition? Uh, so Abim, if I'm pronouncing it right, um, last, I, I guess you didn't uh, attend last week. Acquisition is when your company is bought. So say you have company XYZ that, that makes an app uh, that, that uh, enables better chatting between students and Facebook says, look, this is interesting. Let me acquire the company. And, and therefore, after Facebook acquires you, you've achieved an exit. But in, in essence, it was an acquisition of your core technology, of your people, of your, the state of your company. So there are two things that we have to look at uh, in financials that I want you to remember. It's these two equations. Um, and again, if it's anything you pay attention to today, please pay attention to this. Uh, of course, pay, pay attention to everything. But statement or equation number one is what is profit? Profit is revenue minus cost, right? So what is revenue? Revenue is what you earn from selling your product. So suppose again, you have an app. And like, suppose again, you have an app that, uh, that enables better chatting between students. Uh, and suppose you sell that app for a dollar each. And suppose you sell that, sell 100,000 of those apps. So therefore your revenue is $100,000. So very simply, what you achieve in selling your product is revenue. Cost, um, Akshat, exit, we talked about at length uh, last week. Uh, there is a slide in last week's presentation that you that I want you to see that shows what an exit is. Particularly, exit is when the startup uh, either goes public or when it is bought. Acquisition. Uh, and and what are costs? So now we have determined that we have hundred thousand dollars in sales, which is your revenue. But then in in building that product and in marketing it and, and sales, et cetera, you have now expended, say, $80,000. So your costs are $80,000, and therefore profit is $100,000 minus $80,000, which is $20,000. So you have to always start, uh, start to think not only how you will make money, which is achieve revenues, but also how you will make profits. And VCs generally uh, look at, at investing in you such that at one, some point in time, you will be a profitable company. Costs are either direct or indirect, and we'll talk about it. And then the second equation, which I'd like you all to make sure you've, uh, you, you have uh, in you, is what is valuation? 
and therefore what is the value of your company as a measure. And the valuation is nothing but the number of shares outstanding in your company times value of each share. So suppose uh, Google's share value today is whatever it is. Uh, uh, let's, let's use a different example. Uh, Apple's share value today is, what is it? Um, $316 and $85. And say the number of shares outstanding in Apple are uh, 50 million or 100 million, whatever, right? So that would make the valuation of, of uh, Apple to be $318 billion, right? It's, it's much more, so therefore, obviously the number of shares outstanding are more, but always remember valuation of your company is number of shares you have times the value of each share. And each round of funding, as we discussed last time, or each, uh, each infusion of cash into your company creates a value for each share. Uh, when you start off, your value of each share is literally one cent or even lower, but as you grow the company and make it successful, the value of your share increases. And that's the brilliant part of valuation, sir, is because if, even if you own like 15% of what you originally owned, it'll still be worth exponentially higher than what you originally owned. That's right. That's right. And that's how the startup founders become billionaires because at the end of the day, Mark Zuckerberg still owns what 40% of Facebook and Facebook's value today is 500 billion. So his value uh, literally is 200 billion himself. Or, I think, you know, I think his net worth also... His net worth probably goes up, I think, one billion every month or so. By the increase of stock value. Yes, by the increase of stock. That's right. And Facebook today reached an all-time high. Today, today's stock price, if you look at uh, Facebook, it, is, it has never been as high. Um, there are two financial statements that basically are very pertinent to each of these statements, or, or each of these equations. And every startup, as they as they go into raising money or uh, every quarter, you are asked to make sure you have these two financial statements. And the first one is a profit and loss statement, PNL as it's called. And PNL is directly what is the first equation here. It translates into details uh, what are your total in. Uh, what, what are the total dollars coming into the company with respect to revenue? And what are your total costs? And therefore, what is your profit or what is your loss? So, so remember, if your costs are higher than your revenue, that means you're making a loss, right? Most startups for at least the first couple of years or sometimes much longer, and, and companies like Uber even now after over 10 years uh, are making a loss. Uh, but at the same time, the growth of the company is so high that the investors are okay that someday they'll make a lot of profits. The other uh, statement that we have to make sure that we, that we have to always uh, have to present to VCs or to our investors is the balance sheet. And the balance sheet basically all lists your, your assets and assets being what is the core um, value of all of the equipment or other cash, et cetera, other assets that you own. Liability is what you owe. What you owe, you know, maybe these are payments as loans or, or you owe customers refunds, et cetera. And, and really at the end of the day, this determines your assets and liabilities determine your valuation of your company. So what we'll do now is I'm going to latch on to um, and I find this easier. I've, I've done it both ways. I've tried to do this, uh, this class th uh, theoretically as in going to th oh, theory, it doesn't work. Uh, I, I, what I'll do is the rest of my slides are all going to be centered around uh, you having a company that owns an app. Whoever's not in mute, please go on mute. Was there a question? Uh, yes. Yes, go ahead, Tarun. So two things. One, um, do you know what the title of this session will be? Title of this session? What do you mean? Like the title, like the main concept that we're trying it's to cover. It's basically finances. Finances, okay. Yes. And number two, I didn't quite catch 
uh, what you guys were saying about revenue and how is it uh, being very beneficial? Okay, Tarun, um, again, I would like you to ask questions about a particular slide uh, that we have up. If you have a question that is not pertinent no, to yeah, the slide. No, yeah, I had a question about the profit and revenue slide. Hold on, hold on, let me finish. So, okay. you know, what this, what this session's called is on the very first slide, so it's not on this slide, uh, right? And, and specifically with respect to your question on what's revenue, I'm happy to answer that. We just jumped it, but I'm happy to go back and answer. So revenue is uh, actually, you know what? Hold on to that thought, Tarun. Uh, we will get to it. Okay, I'm We'll sorry. get to it actually start. No, no, no problem. We'll, we'll get to it uh, right, right at this slide, starting this slide, right? So again, think about, I'll, I'll center all my discussions around you having a startup and the startup having an app as your product say it's a cool app and again, we can go back to our example of uh, an app that enables student to student chatting. So how do you think about financials, right? Um, so first of all, what problem is your app trying to solve and how? Why is that important for financials? Because that's, that will start to determine what business model you use. Uh, what is unique about your app and how much and what people pay for? So you can start seeing immediately that we are talking about, will people pay for it as a dimensionality, right? An important dimensionality. Because I can solve a lot of world's problems, but guess what, no one will pay for it, right? If people don't pay for it, um, you know, will there be other ways by which you can monetize it? Monetize meaning, can you charge, uh, can you charge say advertisers to post ads on your app, right? Um, what else do you think your app users would be willing to pay for, right? So that's another dimensionality, which is okay. Today I just do chatting, but what if I introduce a concept of also sharing uh, files? Will will the will the consumers pay more for it, right? And therefore, what is the business model? And then look at your competitors and what business models they are, are using. Uh, let's look at you know uh, another chat app and what business model they're using, and how well. Is it working for them? So all of these, all of these kind of introspective questions will get you to start thinking about how should you sell your product, right? And therefore, once you once you start selling the product, you will start accumulating what we call revenues. So Tarun, if I have if I charge a dollar for every app, and I say sell ten thousand apps. So then my revenue is $10,000 because I recognize by selling the product, $10,000 in revenue as we call it. Got it. Make sense? Um, and then once you start going through, okay, I'll start charging a dollar for it. Then, you know, we can, we can start looking at also what costs are associated with it. And we'll go through costs in just a second. Now here is an exercise for you guys, right? So today, what is the business model that Facebook as an app, you know, the Facebook, the core app, not Instagram, not WhatsApp. Let's look at, just to simplify things, Facebook as, as a service. What is the business model they use today? It's like a chatting and sharing web service. What is the business model they use today? What is Facebook as a core app, as a, a service? that's available as a Facebook app on your mobile device or facebook.com where you have a user ID associated with you. How does Facebook today make money? What is the business model? Yes, Tarun, you're right, ads. Yes, Arav, you're right, ads. Uh, and Lorenzo, thank you, right? And Anya as well, right? So think about it, right? Every consumer, you that uses Facebook, uh, uses it for free. There's no fee to charge, to pay, to pay to Facebook for it. But Facebook makes a lot of money, uh, specifically 20 plus billion dollars a quarter, so $80 billion a year, uh, by basically selling advertising. So here is another exercise for you. What if Mark said, look, I hate advertising and I want to start charging a dollar for every user of uh, Facebook. Every 
user of Facebook now, I will say I will charge a dollar a month. So what will Facebook's revenue then be? Why will it be a low arrow? Uh, Krish. So how many unique users does Facebook have per month? Two and a half billion. 2.3, sir. 2.3 billion. Correct. So if you sell it for a dollar a month, you're selling it for two, you're making revenues of $2.3 billion per month. Right? Which is how, many, how much per year? close to $30 billion a year. So today, Facebook is making $60 billion a year. So yes, it will be reduced. So if Mark decided that he'd start charging $2 for each user per month, and there will be no advertising, then he'll probably end up making $60 billion in revenue, right? Whereas if he actually cut out the advertisement, sir, he would make $27.6 billion a year. There you go, there you go. So what if he charges two dollars? He starts to he starts to make as much money as he makes with advertising, right? Because today their annual revenues are close to sixty billion dollars. <coughs> so <coughs> so this is why uh, I want you guys to introspect uh, on revenue and think about different models because because this is what will make you better understand what revenue is. So here are some example models to help you because most of you again are doing an app of some kind. Here are some example models that help mobile apps make money. Number one, free but with ads. In-app advertising as we just uh, learned about Facebook, there is also, you know, LinkedIn and Instagram and WhatsApp and Facebook, uh, you know, uh, Messenger. All of the apps, most of the apps that we see are all in number one. And then there is this freemium, which is you offer a base level of an ad for free. And then if you have to uh, use some advanced features, you pay for it. So that's a freemium model. Right, and LinkedIn today have, follows this model where uh, use of the base service is free, but if you have to have the ability to chat, uh, to send direct messages to say recruiters, you have to sign up for the premium membership and premium membership is what, 25, 24 99 per month. That's an example of a freemium card. Number three, paid application, which is look, uh, unless you pay for it, you cannot buy it. A lot of you uh, of the 14 teams that are sending me your business models, I'm seeing that a lot of you are, are looking at this model, which is the paid apps, which is great. Because guess what? If you have something of true value and you think consumers will pay for it, then why not charge for it, right? Uh, fourth one is in-app purchases, which is similar to premium, premium. But then if you look at uh, apps like Headspace where uh, you know, the, you, you, you download the app, but at the end of the day, when you have to choose between 50 different features, you end up paying uh, for the feature that you select. Paywalls are subscriptions, which is, it's not a one-time buy, but you pay a monthly fee. Uh, and then last one is sponsorships, which is that the app or parts of the app are sponsored by someone else. So you're forced to uh, to make sure you listen to the messaging of the sponsor. Does this make sense? I see a lot of people enamored by Mark Zuckerberg's richness. Let's focus on the class, please. Now, the other side of the equation is costs, right? And when I see financial models from most of my students, most of my students, when they create a business plan, as we will in week eight, um, a lot of people overlook some, some costs. For example, rent that you pay when you rent an office is a cost. For example, 
internet that you buy at your office is a cost. Um, the heating and cooling, your pg and &E bill is a cost. So always remember to do good analysis on costs. Uh, costs are the cost of developing the app, um, you know, paying your developers, et cetera. Uh, cost drivers also based on stages. Uh, a company in the initial stage versus someone who's in a much later stage have different costs. Um, costs associated with planning and design, uh, your development process, which is software development, uh, testing and deployment, the costs associated with that, infrastructure and hosting, you want to host a service. You have to pay AWS or, or Google Cloud or Azure Cloud for it. So think about the cost there. Uh, think about support. So if something doesn't work in your in your product, uh, people are, are, are will want to call a 1-800 number. Uh, most people don't overlook support costs because support can be probably one of the highest costs. If you release an application that has not been fully tested, if it's buggy, your support costs increase incrementally because people will call your 1-800 number. Guess what? Every 1-800 number also costs and you have to pay the phone service for a free, free toll-free call. So costs are, are, are a tricky thing. I want you guys to make sure as you develop a business plan, you think through each of these. There's also obviously costs associated with legal, with administration, uh, with sales and marketing activities. For example, uh, if, you, uh, if you put a website together for marketing, there's a cost for the, for the web hosting. Uh, suppose you put together brochures and you distribute brochures at a fair, there's cost of printing that. So marketing sometimes is also a very high, high cost driver. In fact, in the dot-com bust of 2000, 2008, those two dot-com busts, uh, most companies that went kaput, that had to, had to dissolve, were because their marketing costs were just out of control. Another example of marketing cost is Uber. Right, and this is this is such a such a glaring example, right? So today, um, you know that when you take an Uber ride, uh, for every ride that you take, a venture capitalist is actually paying for a ride, for part of the ride, uh, and 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 it shows because Uber is still losing money, right? It's not profitable, and so therefore the VCs are are pumping money into Uber to keep it alive, to keep it, uh, to keep it operating. And guess what? Therefore, when you get an Uber ride, you are getting someone else to pay for it, right? So that's another marketing cost, uh, which is very high, operating costs. So now uh, I, I, have, I have a video that explains a little bit more what p &L is. I purposefully chose a video that is not um, uh, image heavy, not kind of visually heavy. It is audio heavy because again, in the past we've had issues with, um, with rendering. So hopefully the audio part of this will work. There is no volume. Yeah, I'm trying to figure this out because now in my headset, usually the volume that goes through is through the the speaker. So hold on. <laughs> Technical I, difficulty. I don't think you're sharing your um your computer audio. There's like a button for that whenever you screen share. Yeah. So I in my sharing, it says you're sharing. And then there's also a button that says, uh, like in the bottom of the checkbox, it says share computer audio. Like whenever you start sharing. Hmm. Okay, there's an easier way. Hold on. Like I've done it in the past. Hold on.
or P&M, is an account compiled to show gross and net profit or loss during a specific time period. Profit or loss is equal to your income minus your expenses. For example, you manufacture widgets and sell them to your customers over the internet. During the month of June, your income was £10,000. The first expense you need to subtract is direct expenses. A direct expense is any cost directly related to the production and sale of your product, such as raw materials, shipping costs and labour for assembling the widgets. For this example, your direct expenses are £4,000. This gives you a gross profit figure of £6,000 or 60% gross profit. Next, you need to remove your operating expenses from your business during the month of June. This can include advertising, accountancy fees, heating, lighting, rent, salaries not directly related to sale, and more. For this example, your operating expenses are £4,500. So if we take the income, remove the direct costs and operating costs, this gives you a net profit of £1,500. If your figure is a negative, then you've made a loss during this period. Profit and loss statements show you how much money you're making or losing in a specific time period. They allow you to compare past performance and detect any issues with sales margins and expenses. Get a rebrand. All right. Can you guys hear me or should I go back to my headset? We can hear. We can hear okay, you, sir. Um, all right. So, uh, so this, this, sorry about the British accent and uh, the pounds and so dollars, but I found it to be a very simple uh, but informative um, video on p and And there's a similar one on balance sheet that you'll have to bear with me on the accent. Um, I actually like the accent. Okay, so now that we have kind of figured out the revenue, the profit, the loss, side and then the p l as a statement let's jump into the second equation right which is your assets and liabilities now when you get funding into the company that's an asset correct because you now have cash right so we'll talk about that but uh, i wanted to actually first talk about what type of funding because there was a lot of interest last week uh, there were some questions offline as well on how to get the uh, company uh, funded. So I put this slide together to explain to you the different types of funding models that you could consider. Um, the, the one that we discussed the most is the bottom one, which is uh, venture capital, right? Which is you go to Sandal Road, you pitch to a VC, the VC says, whoa, I like it. I'm going to put money into you. And guess what? Based on their putting money into you, they take a portion of your company as ownership. So equity in the company as it's formally called. So now before you had funding, you as a founder, and suppose you were two founders, you own half of the company. Now the VC has taken one third of your company. So the two founders left now own uh, one, third, one third of the company. So that's kind of how venture capital works. They take a portion of your company and become owners of your company, right? Uh, the other thing we discussed was angel funding and angel funding we discussed could be an any angel. It could be friends and family or it could be an individual investor who comes in. Um, many a times angels don't set, um, don't set valuation for your company. They invest on you uh, and they take some kind of a future. Uh, they take some kind of a future uh, ownership in your company when you do get venture uh, funding at that point when evaluation said they take a portion of your company. That's usually how angels work. We also talked about debt, debt funding. Debt funding is similar, is the same term for loan. So you can go to bank, a bank and say, look, I want, um, I want $10 million as a loan. And usually the bank will not take equity in a company, but they, they will want some kind of, of uh, assets that you show them. Uh, what's called a collateral, and I won't go into that uh, here today, but debt funding is really about you taking a loan. Like if you want to buy a car um, and your dad decides to buy a new car, they take a loan from the bank. It's similar, right? 
And the, uh, one thing, sir. Yeah. There are actually, when you take the process of debt funding, there are actually situations when you will be able to pay without interest within a certain time. Some banks will do that to influence the customer spending. Yeah, people get creative. At the end of the day, uh, remember there's yes. one rule in life, which is there's no free lunch, uh, right? Absolutely. And so uh, so when, when, when a bank is doing that, they're going to take, uh, take something out of you, right? In a similar light, when you go and get your home refinanced and they say zero closing costs, right? Uh, and, and so basically what you end up doing is you end up paying a higher per month percentage rate. And over the course of a loan and in 30 years, when you repay that, your cost to get it funded could have been $2,000, but you ended up paying $10,000 more to the bank based on the higher interest rate, right? Exactly. So again, there's no such thing as free lunch. Um, the other one is crowdfunding. And a lot of you must have heard about uh, Kickstarter uh, or one of those where, you know, you can get the crowd to fund you as, this, as the term suggests. Uh, it's a fun way. I've had a lot of my startups that I have advised um, where they have a cool consumer product. So, uh, so one, one company I was advising had a product where they had a little, on a tennis racket, you know how you have a dampener for, the, for you tennis players? The dampener was actually an electronic mechanism to measure the speed of your racket, the, 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 the velocity of the hit of the ball, et cetera. It, and so they decided to go to Kickstarter and put that thing out and they got funded there. Basically, why will the crowd fund you? Because they want early access to your product because they think your product is really cool. So crowdfunding is another area you guys want to think about. And bootstrapping is uh, where, what I see uh, quite a bit here in the Silicon Valley, especially repeat entrepreneurs where they, where they fund the company with their own money. So when you fund the company with your own money, it's called bootstrapping. Uh, a lot of time it is, uh, yeah, it is, there's another term called moonlighting that you have a primary job, uh, but you're working on a startup at the side, moonlighting meaning working evenings and nights. And, and it's usually bootstrapped where they don't want to go to a VC or an angel to get money. They're just putting their own money into it. So these are kind of, uh, gives you an idea of how to get your company funded. And also, sir, putting your own money into it is also an example of risk. So that gives you that knack for innovation. Yes, yes, agreed. But conversely, when, uh, when someone else's money, uh, when, there is, when someone else's money is available, then why put your own money is the flip side of that. A lot right. of startup founders come to me and say, look, I am, I am bootstrapping my company and I have a team in India that I'm funding. I don't want to go uh, to VCs because I think my idea would be stolen, etc. My advice to them is, look, I mean, at the end of the day, not only does uh, it, it's your money versus someone else's money, but it's also about validation. A lot it of is basically uh, two, three years that on a company, which if they would have gone to a VC, they would have had validation and feedback that immediately would have given them the ability to pivot at that time. Now they're two years too late to pivot because they really believe in an idea and they really believe that they can, they, they will take this to success, but they were living in a, in a vacuum. They were living, living in a black hole, right? That's, that's why startups in normal companies will take up to eight months to perfect. Right. Um, we talked about valuation yesterday, but it's important to put it in this context because we're discussing financial statements. Again, your assets and liabilities, which is your second uh, statement, as we, which is called the balance sheet, uh, determines uh, or, or helps you measure your valuation. Valuation basically, as we discussed last time, has pre-money and post-money valuation. The difference between pre-money and post-money is when you raise a round of funding and say your valuation before the funding was $10 million, and you raise $5 million, your post money valuation is 15 million, your pre money valuation is 10 million. That's a very simple term on how, when people ask you pre or post valuation, how you can answer it. Um, we talked about allocation of shares and incorporation. We talked about incorporating in Delaware as a priority or as, a, as, uh, as uh, one means to do it, where most startup founders do that. 
we talked about how the founders allocate a majority of the shares to themselves when they get started. And then when you get financed, when you get venture capital, how you basically allocate additional shares to, so that the VCs can become part owners. So when you get started, suppose you have 10 million shares that you've allocated and each founder has 5 million, 5 million shares. When you start, um, when you start hiring employees, you will create something called an option pool for the employees. And so you will put up to 20% of your company, 15 to 20% is a norm into the option pool for your employees. And then suppose you get funded, then you will allocate additional shares. Say the VC wants to take 20% of your company, then you will, you will allocate additional shares such that the VC, when the total shares are seen, now owns 20% of the shares. So that's the whole valuation angle. So now let's talk about what the balance sheet is, again, in very simplistic terms. Uh, I'll pause if there are any questions. Okay, here we go. Let's listen to a British balance sheet. A balance sheet is a statement of the assets, liabilities, and equity of the business or other organization at a particular point in time. A balance sheet can also be described as a snapshot of a company's financial condition. A balance sheet is broken up into three sections, assets, liabilities, and equity. The difference between the assets and the liabilities is the equity of the company, also known as net assets, net worth, or capital. So you're starting a business. You go to the bank and get a loan. On your balance sheet, this loan shows as a liability, as it has to be repaid to the bank. It also shows as an asset for the same amount as you have the cash to spend. Thus, the balance sheet is balanced. You need to buy a computer for your new business. The cash in your assets decreases, but your new computer asset helps balance this. As you sell to your customers, your profits are recorded as retained earnings in the equity section. The cash from these profits is recorded in the asset section and the sheet remains balanced. Every month you make a loan payment to the bank. Your liabilities reduce by the amount of the and your cash is reduced by the same amount. If at any point you need to find out your business is worth, go back to the formula from before. Assets minus liabilities equals equity. Get a rebranded version of this video along with many others. Okay. So now, now you understand uh, assets and liabilities. Um, it, assets is what you have as built up uh, things of value, including cash. Liability is what you owe out. And basically what you own versus and minus what you owe out becomes the value of your company. That is at any given point in time, the running value of your company. Um, I, I noticed that last class, people latched on to my, my uh, startup terms, as I call the Sand Hill Road terms slide. So I put together another one of those just for us to either rehash some of the concepts we learned, uh, jargon, yes, Arjun, uh, or to learn a couple of new ones like burn. Uh, but I'll pause if there are any questions. Uh, I'll also pause if someone wants to take a pitch at explaining any one of these terms. And I'd like different people to pick different ideas. You get only one to pick uh, if you want to pick to start explaining to the rest of the group what each term is. So who wants to pick one? Unmute yourself and pick anyone and explain what it is. May I, sir? Yeah, you get one, presume. Yes, I will take bootstrapping, sir. Okay. So essentially, when we are talking about bootstrapping, we are talking about using our own company and financials to fund our startup and basically our rise. So we are not relying on banks for loans or crowds for money, or we're not relying on VCs or angel investors. We're basically using our own money. And while this is also beneficial if there are no VCs or angels investing in our company, it is also a high risk because if the company fails, we might not have the ability to recover from it. Yeah. Spot on. Spot on. Sir, may I do um, crowdfunding? 
uh, one sec, one sec, Anya. Um, bootstrapping generally also has kind of this connotation of, uh, uh, as we learned last time, stealth, uh, stealth mode. Uh, so as Pradyum correctly pointed out, it's the ability to fund ourselves, but also the connotation of it is, look, I mean, I don't want to go out and tell the world I'm doing it, so I'm going to do it quietly. Uh, there's a kind of a parallel correlated uh, stealth aspect to things. Yes, Anya, which one will you pick? May I do crowdfunding? Go for it. So crowdfunding is basically when you go on almost like a campaign. So you ask um, people to fund you. Places like Kickstarter help because um, you tell people your product and then normal people, they don't have to be VCs or angels. They can just, they can choose to fund you basically. Totally. Spot that, on. Uh, one thing I'd like to add, sir. Yeah. But that asking people is basically uh, basically um, you appealing to the people. The product has to be appealing. You need to convince them. So it requires that knack for persuasion. Yep. Agreed. Agreed. So Anya, you're spot on. Um, you, you guys should know that a lot of the crowdfunding is also used to raise money for various kind of uh, you know some uh, causes. And so GoFundMe is another one, Kickstarter is another one. Uh, so it's not just to fund your startup, but uh, it could be used for all kinds of purposes, crowdfunding. Okay, who wants to take the next one? Can I take on? May I do one? Okay, who was first? The person who was heard first. You can go first. Okay. Um, What's so your name? Shreya. I was Shreya, uh, okay. Go. Yeah, go Shreya. So burn is basically all the expenses that are needed to run the business. And like some examples of burn are like salary, marketing, cost of making the goods, paying the bills, etc. Yep, spot on. So burn is how much money you are expending per month. So, um, so suppose you, have, you raise uh, $10 million, right? and you, uh, you don't have any revenues yet. You're not selling the product because you're feverishly developing it. And suppose you are, uh, you are expending a million dollars a month because you have 20 employees, you have a, you have a, a nice office space in San Jose downtown, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So in that case, your burn is a million dollars as Shreya correctly pointed out. Thank you, Shreya. Um, and and guess what? You're in trouble because in 10 months you lose, you, you run out of money. So you either raise another round of funding or in those 10 months, you better have a product ready that starts to give you at least a million dollars of revenue per month so that you can sustain yourself. So this burn thing is a big deal. It's a big, big deal, okay? I'm telling you, every startup founder, uh, remember uh, B. Raman, that ramen thing we discussed in week two, was it? Be yeah. frugal week and two. take the, be frugal and take the VC's money to the next mile. <laughs> yes, exactly. So be ramen, uh, uh, parsimonious like eating ramen and stuff, rich food in your company. So that's burn. How much money are expending per month? Um, okay, who wants to do, Arjun wants to do, I'm sorry, was there someone else before Arjun? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, should I, should I take smart money, sir? No, you, you're done, Pradyum. Uh, Harish? Yeah. Go for it. I'm going to do Arjun dumb Arthur. money. Okay. So I don't want to waste much of your time. So in a nutshell, dumb money is basically money invested by people who are not professional investors. Yes, you're correct. Um, generally... So you're spot on. There's nothing wrong with your uh, definition. Generally, dumb money is those people who invest money in your company and don't get involved, right? So suppose you guys come to me and say, look, I, I have this great startup and we're gonna build uh, an AI application that predicts people's moods. Uh, and I say, look, I'm really excited about that space. I'll, I'll put a million dollars in, that, in, that in your company and then I go away. I don't help you guys. I don't have you think about how what kind of AI algorithms you should use, uh, how you should look at uh, uh, perceiving human emotions, uh, then that's dumb money. It's smart money if I'm really involved 
and I have expertise in that area, and I lend you support to the founders to say, look, have you considered this? Have you, have you thought about these things? Have you looked at this different algorithm, right? So that's uh, dumb money. Thank you. Uh, that was Harish, right? Thank you. You're spot on. Uh, Arjun. I thought you wanted to do runway. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Either way, it's fine, Arjun. Yeah, he's typing. Okay, Abim, you can do post money if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Why don't you go first to post money while Arjun types his answer on runway? Okay, um, so basically post money is just the money that you have left over after you invest in your business and yeah like after you invest in your business all the money that you have left over um so post money is associated with valuation of the company so suppose your valuation of your company is 10 million dollars and suppose you get a vc to invest five million dollars in the company so you have five million dollars of cash in the bank because the vc wrote you a check then your post money valuation is $15 million. And therefore your pre money before you raise the money, which is pre your valuation was $10 million. So pre money and post money is generally associated with a financing event. When a VC puts in money and the amount of the money that the VC puts in uh, added to your previous valuation becomes your post money valuation. Okay. Um, Arjun, runway is how long the company can last if their income and expenses stay constant. So when companies are raising money, they're trying to increase their runway. So yes, runway is how long a company can last. Going back by our example previously, suppose I have $10 million in my bank and my burn is a million dollars each. So my runway is 10 months, right? Unless I'm able to start making money as in have revenue, start selling product, or unless I have new investors come in or the same investor come in and put more money, my runway is 10 months. So what, means, what that means is if there is no other additive um, money or investment in the company, then you're gonna go out of business in 10 months. That's the runway. And the, and the term we use for that is companies being solvent, sir. That solvency is what we calculate. Okay, I'll take that. Anyone else wants to take, oh, there's one term left, I guess. Anyone else wants to take it? We have done paper money two weeks now. What's paper money? It's the valuation of the company before the exit. So it's not actually money that you can use to spend or keep in your bank account, but it's, um, it's, it's more like a, your potential. Yeah. Spot on Lorenzo. Thank you. Um, now let's go back to the $10 million uh, valuation. So I have a company that's valued at $10 million because that was what the VCs invested in at the previous round. So I know that my company is worth $10 million. Uh, and suppose there are 10 million shares in the company and I own 2 million shares. So that means the value of my shares is $2 million. But because the company is still private, that it has not had an exit, my $2 million is nothing but paper money for me. It has no value. There's no ability to use that $2 million to say buy a house or buy a Ferrari or or, 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 or take a, buy a ticket to Elon Musk's uh, Mars flight. I just don't have that ability because it's $2 million of money that is not exchangeable, so it's paper money. Only when a company achieves exit, which is an IPO or an acquisition, does the paper money convert to real money. 
right? Okay. I'm glad you guys enjoyed these financial, these terms discussions. Uh, I, I, I guessed it last week, so um, I'm glad I put it this week together too. Any other terms anybody wants to bring up that I didn't cover that maybe in in your head? May I go over the terms of liquid assets, sir? Liquid assets, okay. Yes. So if I remember this right, essentially liquid assets are basically when we have hard cash in hand, which we can then easily convert into a, um, basically a flourishing or prospering app, uh, a product basically. So that yeah. conversion from hard cash into product is what we call liquid assets. Yeah. 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 Agreed. Okay. Um, I'm kind of over time. I'm sorry. I didn't look at it, but uh, I'm at the end. Don't worry for those who have to run. I do have a couple more terms, which are very Silicon Valley ask and very interesting ones for those who want to stick around. Uh, one is what's called the hockey stick curve. The second one is a unicorn. And I thought you guys will enjoy this discussion on unicorns. Um, and then my last slide is on approaches to financial projections, which given, uh, given uh, you know, the time right now, I won't cover it, but as you guys start building your business plan, uh, go back and look at this slide as to how you will build your financial projections, what's called the forecast. So this slide will guide you on how to do it. So I'm not gonna go through it in this class, but when we do the business plan in week eight, we'll, uh, we'll make sure to go through this, but this is for you to read. Uh, for those who want to run away, uh, here is the homework for, for this week, right? So homework is the same. The first two things are the same, which is include, in, introduce your founding team with titles and the startup name. What does your startup do in two or three bullet points? Remember, I'm only looking for bullet points. I'm not looking for anything verbose. And then describe in two or three bullet points your financial plan, which is if you have an app, are you gonna be selling the app or is it gonna be ad-based? What are your high order costs? So what are the big costs that you'll have to incur? And therefore your margin outlook. Margin outlook being uh, when do you think you'll be profitable? Margin is profitability basically. Uh, so when, when do you think you'll be profitable for how long uh, you will be not profitable depending on, on your high order costs. Okay. So for those who, guys who want to jump away, please feel free to jump away. I'm gonna go through those two terms. Let's do unicorn first. So what's a unicorn? A unicorn is very, again, Silicon Valley term, as term very startup as term. So unicorn is basically a privately held startup. So a company where the company has not gone public but is valued over a billion dollars. So if you remember Uber before it went, uh, it went public, so Uber is now traded on Wall Street, before it went public, it had a valuation of multiple billion dollars. As if you look today, uh, Airbnb, um, and this is a little dated because now with the, with the COVID situation, its valuation has been hammered, but it, Airbnb is not a public company, you cannot buy. Uh, uh, the uh, stock of Airbnb in the, in the, in the, in the markets. Uh, similarly, Stripe, Grab, DoorDash, Wish, Palantir, which is a, a data company, uh, Jewel, which I'm sure none of you know about, but Jewel is worth $50 billion, right? Or at this point, it is worth $50 billion. Thanks to all of you students giving it all this business. Hopefully none of you. So this was as of August, 2019, this valuation. Uh, I'm sure you, none of you know about Jewel. I'm happy none of you know about Jewel. Uh, okay. It is estimated that as of April, 2020, there were 465 unicorns. That means there are 465 companies um, in the world that are valued over a billion dollars, which are not public. So they haven't yet had an exit. Think about it that way, okay? Um, what's a hockey stick curve, right? So a hockey stick curve uh, is a very Silicon Valley-esque term again. If you look at all of these companies that are unicorns, 
that have not gone public. Um, the, the general outlook for a startup in Silicon Valley and how, uh, how a VC looks at it is, they understand that you will not have a lot of revenue in the beginning. In fact, they don't want you to have revenue in the beginning. Uh, it is, they, they basically invest in you so that you can have growth. And if you say you're a consumer company, you, you amass a lot of users, like Facebook has 2 billion users. And then they, they say that if you have enough growth, then you can monetize that later. So generally what happens is for a long period of time, uh, there is subdued growth. And then at some point there's an inflection point, And then you see there is a, a, a lot of exponential growth in revenue like Facebook saw. So Facebook for many, many, many years, eight years, uh, was either not profitable, leave alone profitable, was not generating any revenue. And now, uh, lo and behold, they're a $60 billion revenue company. Right? So generally VCs like to invest in such ideas. Generally when you go to take a loan and if you show a business plan of this type, no one will invest in you because, uh, because when you go for private equity or debt financing, they want to see immediate returns. So that's another so very VC and Silicon Valley-esque way of looking at things, what we call the hockey stick curve. Okay, uh, I'm ready to call the class a wrap. Uh, are there any questions? Okay, going once. Wait, sir, Um, can I yes, still submit some of the old homework from like a few weeks ago? Absolutely. You can still form teams, you can still submit homework to me anytime. You can still mm -hmm. ask me any questions on Slack. I'm as answering every question that was asked to me. Any other questions? Can you review paper money one more time? Okay. So Padma, paper money is money before a company gets an exit. So we know that an exit for a company is either the company going public or the company being bought an acquisition, right? So suppose, let's look at one of the unicorns. Suppose uh, I am the founder of Airbnb and I own 20% of Airbnb and Airbnb's valuation is $29.3 billion. So if I own 20% of Airbnb, my valuation is $5.8 billion, right? But because Airbnb is not public and because it's not bought, I have no way of using that $5 billion I have as a valuation for anything. I cannot use it to buy a house. I cannot use it to buy a car. So before a company achieves an exit, the the value of the company is all paper money. So my value in Airbnb is all paper money. Does that make sense? How, is paper, money, how is paper money different from post money? So post money is a term that is used for valuation. So don't, don't confuse uh, post money and paper money to be interrelated. They're very different concepts, right? So let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, Let's look at paper money in one other way, which is suppose you form a company today and suppose you go and raise, um, say $2 million of funding from Excel Ventures. So now you have $2 million in the bank. And suppose you own 50% of that company, right? And so your shares have some value but do you think you can use any of those $2 million in the bank to buy any personal stuff? No, no. right? Because the, the, the VC has invested that money for you to grow the company, not for your personal wealth. So any valuation you have in that $2 million company is all paper money at the moment. Okay, thank you. Sure. The class is done, Alice, yes. Uh, Arjun, 
how long would a company still be in the making and, and not yet gone public before you know it won't be successful? There is no such uh, rule of thumb, Arjun. Um, you know, a lot of companies have been in the private markets for a long time. For example, uh, FedEx was a private company for, for the longest time before it went public, I believe last year, right? So um, there is no such rule of thumb. Uh, if you look at these 465 companies that are unicorns that are valued over a billion dollar, like DoorDash, a lot of them don't want to go public because you get a different kind of scrutiny in the public markets, which most people don't want. Uh, most startups say, you know what, I'm happy to be private. All right, we have gone way over, sorry. We started late too. So we'll call it a wrap unless there are any more questions. Let's call it a wrap. Thank you all. We'll see you next week or we'll see you in Slack. Thank you. Bye guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.